Take your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter three. Again, so glad you're here for this series called At the Movies this morning. The title of our message is Knocking Out Our Past. Knocking Out Our Past. I want you to turn with your Romans chapter three and verse 23. We're gonna read this very familiar, very simple, very short verse of scripture that will serve as the umbrella or the theme of our message this morning. Romans chapter three, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, would you say that with me out loud? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Father, this morning, all of us have repeated this verse because this verse applies to all of us. All of us have messed up. All of us have come short. All of us are desperately in need of your mercy and grace. And Lord, for those who are haunted by their past, I pray, Lord, today as we look into the metaphor of this movie, Creed Three, that God, you will give us the strength, the ability, the courage to step up and to knock out our past when it comes to reach for us. And so, Father, today I pray that you would move, that you would touch me, that you would anoint me, help me, Lord, to preach this word as you would have it preached. And Lord, for all the results that will come, we will give you glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, yeah. amen. Knocking out our past. This message this morning is taken from the movie Creed Three. How many of you have seen Creed Three? Let me see your hands. Okay, not as many as I thought. Okay, how many of you have ever seen the Rocky, any of the Rocky movies? Would you raise your hand? Oh, okay. Now we're back. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. The Creed movies are uh, an extension, a plus one, an add-on to the franchise of the Rocky movies. And I wanna take you back a little bit and kind of trace the steps that lead up to Creed. You think all the way back to the first Rocky movies, Rocky one and two, which were originally released in the 70s, were introduced to the Italian stallion, Rocky Balboa, a guy who wasn't the, t uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he was tough as nails. And he gets a title shot against this super flamboyant, arrogant, loudmouth champion by the name of Apollo Creed. We know that he doesn't prevail in Rocky one, but in Rocky two, we know that Rocky finally takes him down. Rocky becomes the champion of the world as he defeats Apollo. After that feat in Rocky three, Rocky goes on to fight Clubber Lang, who was played by Mr. T. Hey, who? Remember him? <laughs> And in this movie, Rocky loses his beloved manager, Mickey. The older guy, Mickey, he, he has a, a, a medical episode, dies, and Rocky seems lost without him. And in a reversal of roles, Apollo comes back into Rocky's life, not as his opponent or his antagonizer, but literally as his manager, to train him, to help him to defeat Clever Lang. And then we move into Rocky number four. And in Rocky four, Apollo decides that he wants to fight again. And so he has got this exhibition matchup with this superhuman Russian fighter, Ivan Drago. By far, Rocky IV is my favorite of all of the Rocky movies. And now Rocky is going to serve as Apollo's trainer, as his manager. And Apollo gets into that fight and he's fighting the Russian and the Russian is beating him down badly. Everybody's yelling to Rocky, throw in the towel, throw in the towel. Apollo looks at him and says, man, don't do it, don't do it. And he tries to represent the desires of his friend. He holds back from throwing in the towel of giving up. We know that Apollo is knocked out. When he's knocked out, he's actually killed. He is killed as a result of the injuries he sustained in that fight. And then we move into Rocky five and six where Sylvester Stallone committed crimes against humanity by even releasing those movies. That's how bad they were. I mean, come on, man. That was some bad, bad movies there. And I bring you to this timeline to set up the context behind Creed because in the Creed movies, we see the emergence of Apollo's son, Adonis. And you say, man, I, I'm thinking back over the Rocky movies. I don't remember him having a son by the name of Adonis. Well, he didn't, they were, the, the writers wrote him in. It seems that in the Rocky universe, sometime before Apollo fought the Russian, that he stepped out in his marriage, had a relationship with another woman, and as a result of that, a son was born from that romance, Adonis. Adonis remained hidden away from the knowledge of, of Apollo's wife, but after Apollo dies, she learns of him, learns that he's being raised in a home for juvenile delinquents, she goes and she adopts him and brings him into the home to have him raised there 
in the home of a dad that he never knew. And by the time we arrive in Creed 3, we've gone through two previous movies dealing with Creed and Adonis has now risen to become the world champion. He has successfully defended his title many, many times. He's now seemingly at the end of his career. He's now ready to shift gears into another season of his life. He's wanting to promote the next generation of fighters that are trained in his gym. And then quite unexpectedly, a figure from his past emerges that opens a painful backstory that has long been forgotten for Adonis. While Adonis was being raised in this home for troubled teens, he, he met a friend by the name of Damien. Damien was this rising star. He was a Golden Gloves boxer. He had aspirations of Olympic gold and being a successful fighter to one day become the world champion himself. And they're being raised there together. And in fact, this scene that you're about to see, Dame has just successfully won a fight. This is why they're still yet teenagers. And they're riding around to celebrate this victory when all of a sudden, Something unexpected happens. Let's watch clip number one. Unfortunately, due to copyright, we are not allowed to show the movie clips on our online broadcast. So instead, I will be explaining what happens here. In this clip, we see a young Adonis and Dame pulling into a mini mart parking lot, talking about what they're planning on getting. Dame stays in the car as Adonis goes in to buy what they want. As Adonis heads toward the front of the mini mart, he passes a grown man and has a flashback to the same man trying to beat him up at his old group home. Adonis calls out, Leon? To which Leon responds, huh? Adonis asks if he remembers him and Leon retorts, what, am I supposed to know? Before Leon can finish his sentence, Adonis punches him in the face while yelling, not so little anymore, you remember me now? Leon falls to the ground as Adonis continues to beat him. It is only Adonis who is throwing punches as Leon is slowly becoming unconscious. Two men come running and drag Adonis off of Leon. Dame comes around the corner, pointing a gun, commanding them to get off of him. They put their hands up and back away from Adonis as cops pull into the parking lot. Dame puts his gun down and backs away from it with his hands up. Adonis at this point runs away, leaving Dame at the scene of the crime. To write down the, number, the first point this morning, everyone has a past. Fill in that blank, everyone has a past. Like Adonis, all of us have some pain and regret in our lives from something we've done in our past. In the clip, he happens to cross paths with his abuser. Again, these are, this is a flashback to their teenage years. The little guy walking into the store, that's, that's Adonis. And he passes by and he notices this guy that had abused him while he was in this home for troubled kids. He calls out to him, the guy doesn't recognize him, and then he begins to fight him. He begins to take out his rage for the abuse that he has sustained as a kid to fight this guy in the moment. We saw the other guys, the, the friends of his abuser that come to pull him off, and then as they are trying to subdue Adonis, here comes Dane, the older guy, walking up with a gun, ready to defend his friend in that moment. But just as he pulls that gun, the police come to the scene, they arrive. What we didn't know about Adonis is he had several prior convictions. When he pulled that gun out in, in that scene, that act would cause him to go to prison for 18 years. But in the moment, in the chaos of the moment, Adonis, scared, begins to run away. He runs away to become champion one day, and Adonis is left behind to be caught, and he goes to prison. You see this past that Adonis has would haunt him. Some of us may relate in one way or another to a past that haunts us today. Because according to our theme passage this morning in Romans 3.23, that all of us, every one of us, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If that's true, say amen. 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 That's me, that's every one of us here today. What is the glory of God in this particular verse of Scripture? Well, it's the perfection of God. And all of us would quickly admit that we are not perfect. Would you say amen again? Amen. And without perfection, all of us have a past that we are trying to overcome. Right. So this is the reality for every person who has ever lived except for Jesus. Jesus is the only person who ever lived on the face of planet Earth who lived a perfect life. While he is the ultimate champion of our faith, we all have a number of biblical heroes that we look up to people that we can relate to a little better because they sin like we did. So allow me to read a verse of scripture taken from Hebrews 11 that describes these other heroes that we have in our life. Hebrews eleven thirteen says this. These all, the, all these heroes died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
This verse is talking about all these different heroes that I will mention to you in a moment who were imperfect just like all of us, yet they saw a promise of life to come. They saw the promise of Messiah, the promise of Jesus, and because of that, they were saved from this earth, they overcame these things, and they made their way to heaven one day. This verse in Hebrews 11 is referring to a laundry list of heroes that are discussed in this chapter, Hebrews 11. The place of this particular passage is called the Hall of Faith. It is the biblical Hall of Fame, but it's also the biblical Hall of Shame. Because all of these folks had a history. All of these folks had a past. Let me list them for you. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that they all live by faith. By faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Isaac, by faith, Jacob, by faith, Joseph, by faith, Moses, by faith, the children of Israel, by faith, the people of Jericho, by faith, Rahab. And the writer goes on to give honorable mentions to Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. As you begin to process these people, they are literally the who's who of the Bible. These are the ones we admire. These are the ones we tell Bible stories about. These are the ones that we pray to be like. Oh God, make me a man of God like one of these men of God. But these folks, although they were heroic, they had a past they had to overcome. While they represent a list of saints and heroes, they are at the same time a list of liars, cheaters, scoundrels, murderers, Drunks and worse. All of them had to overcome tremendous failures in their past to one day become a hero of the faith. They captured imaginations and equally broke many hearts. They were hallowed by history and at the same time, they were haunted within their own souls. They made God clap for them and they made God cry. Can anyone relate? Absolutely, all of us can. All of us have been high, all of us have been low. All of us have been obedient, all of us have been disobedient. All of us have got, brought God joy and all of us have turned God's stomach to make him sick. All of us. Some of us don't feel like that we can do anything for God. We look back on our past and we tell ourselves and we tell our world and we even tell God that we are damaged goods. We're a lost cause. We're a hopeless case, an empty suit, a living regret. But just because you can't see beyond your past doesn't mean that God can't see beyond your past. You've got to know today that God can see beyond your past failures. Yes, you have sinned, but you don't always have to be a sinner. Yes, you have broken down, but that doesn't mean that one day you won't break through. Yes, you have made God cry, but one day you will make him clap again. Can somebody say amen this morning? So get this in your spirit this morning. Failure is not final and failure is not fatal. God takes you beyond your failure by faith. Everybody shout by faith. faith. Shout it this time like you mean it. Say by faith. faith. God takes us beyond our failures into a glorious future by faith. You will never feel worthy, usable, holy, or righteous, but by faith you can be victorious. You can overcome, defeat the enemy, redeem your life, resurrect your dreams, receive the promise, and one day hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand this morning. Just because you have a failure in your past, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to live there. You're supposed to live beyond that to make that the platform of your testimony in the future. You don't believe me? Listen to these verses about these heroes, all of these folks who messed up in Hebrews 11, 32 through 40 that tells us the rest of the story about what God was able to do through these failures in life, how he rescued them from failure to become forever enshrined in the faithful Hall of Faith. Let's now look at this Hebrews 11, verse 32. I'm gonna read fast, so keep up with me fast in the back. I could go on and on, but I've run out of time. There are so many more. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. Through acts of faith, they toppled kingdoms, made justice work, took the promises for themselves. They were protected from lions, fires, sword thrusts, turned disadvantage to advantage, won battles, routed alien armies. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. 
They were those who under torture refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, resurrection. Others braved abuse and whips and yes, chains and dungeons. We have stories of those who were stoned, sawed in two, murdered in cold blood. Stories of vagrants wandering the earth in animal skins, homeless, friendless, powerless. The world didn't deserve them, making their way as best they could on the cruel edges of the world. Not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. God had a better plan for us, that their faith and our faith would come together to make one completed whole, their lives of faith not complete apart from ours. So God is talking about all these failures in life as he's talking to us as failures in life. And he said their story and our story are forever inter connected together. In fact, I'm weaving their failures into your failures and your faith into their faith. And I want you to know that when they overcame their failures and began to believe me and live for me by faith, they did things unthinkable. They toppled kingdoms. They faced torture. They faced even death as a martyr. But in that moment, they would not turn back because they had tasted of the faithfulness of God. They had seen that he is good. And friends, today, God wants to take you beyond your past to allow you to taste something better than you ever had before, that God will give you an appreciation for this life as you overcome the things that tried to destroy you. God is writing another chapter. He is making sure that you are in his writing in the saga of faith, taking their failures and our failures and washing them in the blood of his son so that one day when we get to heaven, the angels will have to step aside to hear us along with all of those failures sing the song of the redeemed, to literally step up in that moment to say that no, we have been saved by blood divine, glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign, I have been redeemed. Come on, one more time, give him praise. So everyone has a past. Number two, our past always tries to knock us out. Write that down. Our past always tries to knock us out. In this next clip, watch as Adonis and Dame come face to face after Dame's release from prison. Let's watch. Again, due to copyright, we are not allowed to show the movie clips on our online broadcast, so instead I will be explaining what happens here. In this clip, we see a grown Adonis walking out of the gym while on the phone. As he walks towards his car, he sees a hooded man leaned up against it. He hangs up the phone and calls out to the man saying, hey man, can I help you? The man asks for an autograph to which Adonis replies that he isn't giving autographs, but he can get off his car. The man asks Adonis if he remembers him. He makes a comment about how Adonis has come a long way from bumming rides from his mom. Adonis, trying to figure out who this man is, suddenly realizes and nervously says, Dame, boy, you had me. Dame said that he had just gotten back to the hood and went to stop by the old gym, but uh, Adonis chimes in that they had upgraded a couple years ago. Dame says that it's been a minute and after a long, somewhat awkward pause, Dame says that he doesn't wanna take up Adonis's time, but just wanted to come and tell him what's good and if Adonis wants to catch up, just to let him know. And as Dame walks off, Adonis asks where he's headed. Dame says he's headed back to the crib and Adonis invites him to go eat. The next scene shows Adonis and Dame seated at a diner. Dame comments that he's surprised that Adonis still comes and eats with the common folk. Adonis says that he does when he can and mentions that there are a lot of things that he can't do anymore that he used to. Dame remarks that he's living that high life to which Adonis says, well, this comes with the job. Dame pours hot sauce on his food and asks Adonis if he knows how long it's been since he's had this. Adonis asks how long and Dame answers that it's been 18 years.
Adonis asks if he has been down this whole time. Dame says that he had a few years tacked on, but yeah, and he just got out last week. Adonis congratulates him on his release, and Dame continues the conversation by telling Adonis that he had wrote him a few times while he was in. Adonis asks where he sent them, and Dame said to Mama Crete's. Dame asks if she's still up in Bel Air, and Adonis tells him that she is, and she's in the same house too, but he never got the letters from Dame. Dame continues on telling Adonis that he watched every single one of his fights and said that it made him proud when he ended his run. Adonis asks Dame if he has work and Dame says, I got plans. Adonis tells him that if there's anything he can do for him, he can help, just ask. Adonis then tries to offer him money, but Dame rejects it saying that he has it all situated and he didn't come to see Adonis for a handout. Adonis says he didn't mean it like that and takes the money back. Adonis asks Dame what his plan is and Dame says that it's the same program last time he saw him. He wants to be champ. Dame still wants to box and even though he has been away a long time, he says he's kept himself in shape and even has some moves that Adonis has not seen yet. Adonis says, all right, come by the gym and we will set you up with Duke. Dame is shocked and asks, for real? To which Adonis says, for real. And Dame says, thank you. The next scene shows Dame punching a punching bag while Adonis and Duke talk. Duke is obviously not too happy about Adonis bringing Dame in and comments that Dame is older than Adonis. Adonis says that he's just trying to give him a break and asks Duke, isn't that what we do anyways? Duke says no, and Adonis tells Duke to look around. No one wants to fight their top fighter, Felix. He asks Duke to just, just let him spar. Duke says that he knows what he's doing and says to Adonis, you don't owe this dude nothing, nothing. But let's spar, let's do it. So our past always tries to knock us out. Donis is going about his normal day, comes outside his gym, and a blast from his past is leaning against his Rolls Royce. But watching these scenes, you, you feel the tension, you feel the awkwardness. It's like, oh, I, this, is, this is kind of makes me nervous. When you see the past paying a visit, Dame, who's representing his past, seems trustworthy, he seems harmless as he re-enters Adonis' life. Adonis is not thinking strategically when he makes accommodation for Dame, when he makes accommodation for his past. Please understand how you treat your past is important. Spiritually, how you treat your past is important. I wanna do my best to teach you something very quickly that may be one of the most important things that you can come to understand in your spiritual life. I want to teach you the difference between conviction and condemnation. Say it with me, say conviction, conviction. Condemnation. condemnation. One more time, say conviction, conviction. Condemnation. condemnation. So let's begin with conviction. I know these words sound a lot alike. And if you're not careful and carefully discerning, they may feel similar to you in your spirit. But let's talk about what conviction is. Notice this verse from John 16, verse eight. John 16, verse eight. When he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Notice in the first, the Holy Spirit's coming to convict the world. What is the world? All people outside of Christ, all unredeemed people, all unsaved folks. He convicts the saved, but his primary purpose is to convict those without Jesus of their sin, of judgment, of righteousness. One of the primary things that the Holy Spirit does for us before we are saved is to convict us of our sins. When the Holy Spirit is dealing with you, he's convicting you. He's pointing out things in your life that separate you from God. Why? As you begin to see that you have sinned, the Holy Spirit reveals that you have primarily sinned against God. Psalm 51 verse four, it's not on the screen. David says this about his own life. He said, against you and you only, O God, have I sinned. And done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. 
David said, I've sinned against one person primarily against you, God, and you're the judge. Again, the Holy Spirit's trying to convict us of sin and of judgment. If we've sinned, we're subject to judgment. And who is the judge? God is the judge. Jesus is the judge. Therefore, knowing that we have sinned against God, who is our judge, and that judgment is coming, what are we to do? We are to repent and ask forgiveness of our sins. When the Holy Spirit points us out, we say, God, please forgive us. What happens then? God forgives us and does a work in us called justification. Everybody say justification. It's a $10 word that's a legal term that means after we have been forgiven by God, God looks upon us just as if we never sinned. We are declared not guilty. God knows we're guilty. You know you're guilty, but God says, no, not, not guilty. Why? Because Jesus himself literally took the punishment that was prescribed for me and for you upon himself. Therefore, he gets all the punishment of sin and we're able to go free. We are justified. The only sinless person who ever lived was punished on our behalf. So conviction points out sin so that sin can be forgiven and we can be declared not guilty. You say, okay, pastor, I think I'm tracking with you, but what about condemnation? Well, what is the root word for condemnation? It's the first seven letters of that word, C-O-N-D-E. E-M-N, condemn. When we receive condemnation, the Holy Spirit is not condemning us. The devil is condemning us. The origin of conviction is the Holy Spirit. The origin of condemnation is the devil. And the devil comes to condemn. Well, when someone condemns you, what does that mean? Well, the definition says to prove or show the guilt of. So the devil comes to us to show us our guilt, to show us our shame. You say, well, how is that different from conviction? Well, in conviction, we are shown something in our life that is yet, that is yet, that is yet to be forgiven. When we are the target of condemnation, we are being tortured by something that is already, that has already, that has already been forgiven. Do you see the difference today? You may say, wait, 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 Pastor, I am guilty. I did it. Uh, the blood's on my hands, the gloves fit. My fingerprints were on the crime scene. I got you. I'm picking up what you're laying down this morning. There's just one problem with your logic. Jesus took your penalty and justified you and declared you not guilty. Get this picture in your mind. The judge that you stand before got down from off his bench and came down and stood in your place and said, I'm the one who needs to be punished, not you. I don't know what you're doing here. Get out of here. I'm the guilty party, not you. That's what it means to be set free. That's what it means for the Lord to do a justifying work. Pastor, does the Bible really say that? Look at this verse from Romans chapter eight, verse one. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Everybody say no condemnation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. When you are in Jesus, nobody else can condemn you. Nobody else can bring up your past because it has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ himself. If Jesus has declared you not guilty, there is no devil in hell that can rise to condemn you. They may try, your own soul may try, but the one seated upon heaven's throne says, all I can see is the blood of my son who has paid the price for you. Come on, somebody. To give the Lord a hand. Amen. Third and final point, God will use the defeats of our past to give us victory in our future. Write that down. God will take the defeats of our past to give us victory in the future. Let's watch clip number three. Again, due to copyright, we are not allowed to show the movie clips on our online broadcast, so instead, I will be explaining what happens here. In this clip, Dame, dressed in black shorts and gloves, and Adonis, dressed in white shorts and gloves, spar it out in the boxing ring while a giant crowd cheers around them.
Suddenly, the crowd disappears and it's just them boxing in the ring. The ring turns into a gel cell at certain points and then turns back into a ring. Each man gets their fair share of hits in. Adonis backs Dame into a corner at one point and gives him a good beating. Dame seems unfazed and continues to fight. They both go in for a punch and each knocks the other in the face at the same time. The crowd suddenly comes back in and Dame and Adonis continue to fight until Adonis sees a shot and knocks Dame out. Adonis Creed is crowned the new heavyweight champion of the world and the crowd goes wild around him and the scene ends. In the scene, Adonis is fighting Dane, not as a former childhood friend, but as someone who's come to destroy him. This fight, Dane is the champion now, not Adonis. Adonis is fighting him to get back something he believes is rightfully his. In a sense, he's, he's trying to take something back that was stolen from him. As they each sit in their respective corners, the flashbacks of the past bring clarity to the present. Everything goes empty. All that's left is you standing toe to toe with the accuser of your soul. The ring turns into a jail because condemnation is a prison all to itself. To illustrate this moment, I wanna portray to you what happens next when you begin to fight the accuser of your soul, the devil. You can welcome to the stage this morning, the devil played by Pastor Chad Lashley. Let's give him a hand. So in this life, when you stand toe to toe with the devil, the devil wants to take your past, represented by this pool noodle. <laughs> it's the best we can do, folks. And he wants to attack you with it. And so he begins to attack you. You're no good. Oh, you failed. You'll never be what God intends you to be. He will hit you over and over. Is he broke? Come on. <laughs> Over and over again, he hits you and he hits you and he hits you and you're tired and you're weak and all of a sudden, at one moment, you just fall. <laughs> one, two, three. Come on, count with me. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've just about had enough of that. But you come to a moment in the 12th round when they think that you are down and out for the count and you begin to take what the devil has used to attack you with and you begin to attack him. And you say, no weapon formed against me will prosper. God is for me, not against me. I will overcome, I will not be defeated. Get out of here. What you looking at? You see, there comes a moment when you gotta take the very thing that the devil is attacking you with and let it become your weapon. 
to lean into the fact that we failed, we've fallen short, we've messed up, but it's not going to define us. We're gonna use the thing that we thought that would define us to defeat every weapon that is formed against us in our life. To overcome, to be victorious. And today, God wants to make you victorious over your past. Come on, pray with me. Father, this morning, I thank you that you give us victory over our past. That, Lord, today you can save people who have a long, long record of crimes against you. That, Lord, today the judge will declare them not guilty because the judge has died in their place. And that, Lord, today we pray for every person who is saved, born again, loves you, comes to church, but is haunted by something in their past. Lord, today set them free because you said in your word, John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Yes. And so, God, give us that final, complete work of freedom today in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, with heads bowed, nobody's looking around. You'd say, Pastor, I'm here today and I've got a long list of crimes against God. I need God to forgive me, to wash away my past so that I can have hope in the present and hope for my future. If that's you, the Holy Spirit's convicting you. The Holy Spirit's been pointing out some things in your life that need to be forgiven. You're ready to repent. Lift up those hands and say, pray for me, Pastor, it's me. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Bless you, thank you, so many of you. Yeah, 2022, 20, 23, 24, 25, several more, maybe 30, 35 people raising their hands. Put your hands back down. Pray this prayer out loud with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. All the things I've done wrong, come into my heart. Take away my shame. Save me. Make me new. I commit my life to you. Now and forever. Now and forever. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. Come on, give him a hand this morning. Amen.